I now look to Dr Paul Oquist to close the case for the proposition. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. President. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. When I saw the proposition of this debate, I quickly checked the letter of invitation to see if it was dated 2016 or 1816. In 1816, slavery and slave trade were considered legal, and wars of conquest with the colonization of the vanquished were standard operating procedure. And later, the opium wars expanded trade. All of these abominations were accompanied by racist theories of white superiority, white man's burden, manifest destiny, evangelizing heathens, and civilizing natives. Imperialist competition led to wars in the colonies, and finally two great world wars between blocks of metropoles with disastrous consequences. The end of slavery and decolonization advanced humanitarian law. The League of Nations, the United Nations Charter, the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, and the International Court of Justice constructed international law and institutions that clearly recognize the sovereign rights of nation states. The only acceptable relations between states are now based on mutual respect and agreements must be consensual, not impositions. To ignore international law and institutions in 2016 is to risk reverting the might to might breaks right and continual violent conflict. To posit that the West, with its historical baggage, undertake impositions is neocolonialism, pure and simple. Our first conclusion is that the West, nor anyone else, has the right to imposition or domination, period. Despite the fact that it has no right to do so, the West is continually imposing its will on developing countries through its economic, technological, political, and military power as well as double standards, extortion, blackmail, covert action, intervention, wars, and occupations, with little thought being given to the consequences. The results have been generally disastrous to the point that in this century, we are living permanent warfare. Afghanistan, 2001, Iraq, 2003, Libya, 2011, and Syria, 2011, are continuing wars with no end in sight. They have led, I will be pleased to take it in due course. Uh, they have led to massive death and destruction, nation wrecking and institutional collapse, economic and social chaos, poverty and flows of millions of refugees. President Obama, in his interview in Atlantic Magazine recently, characterized Libya as a mess, a characterization easily extendable to Afghanistan, Iraq, and Syria likewise. Our second conclusion is that the interventions and impositions of the West are generally disastrous for the countries involved, as well as for humanity. The world in 2016 is, an on, is facing an ongoing environmental crisis that will lead to the catastrophic deterioration of the environment of developing countries with or without environmental standard provisions and trade agreements in conditions attached to financing or environmental agreements. The World of Meteorological Organization and the Met Office are in agreement that we are now at one degree centigrade above the pre-industrial level and above 400 parts per million if, uh, ppm, parts per million. What do we have at one degree? All of the ice in the world is melting. Arctic, Antarctic, Greenland, mountain glaciers, all of it is melting at one degree. We just had one of the strongest El Nino since 1950 and Many countries are suffering four-year droughts. Deserts are expanding, biodiversity is increasingly threatened. To take but one example, the Sahel, nine countries with 100 million people, it is already facing crop and herd losses due to drought and the expansion of the Sahara, as well as the drying up of Lake Chad. If these states collapse, 45 million thirsty, hungry refugees could march north. Europe doesn't know what to do with one million. Try to figure out what to do with 45 million. Mother Earth is trying to tell us something, and if we're listening, we're not acting on the message. Our third conclusion is that the environmental standards will make no difference at all due to catastrophic environmental decline if the world average temperature increase is not kept below 1.5 degrees centigrade. The Paris Agreement states, and I quote, holding the increase of the global average temperature to well below two degrees centigrade above pre-industrial levels 
and pursuing efforts to limit the temperature increase to 1.5 degrees centigrade above pre-industrial pre levels, recognizing that this would significantly reduce the risks and impacts of climate change." End of quote. Unfortunately, the Paris Agreement as is does not lead us to that. It leads us, at its self states, to 55 gigatons of additional CO2e in 2030. And what it doesn't state, but the UNFCC has clearly stated, is this puts us on track for 2.7 to 3.5 degrees temperature increase that translate to four to six degrees in developing countries. So we have the fact that the Paris Agreement creates international policy incoherence with the Sustainable Development Goals, the Convention on Desertification, and the Biodiversity Convention. The estimates of the consequences include 250,000 additional deaths per year between 2030 and 2050 due to heat stress, diarrhea, and the spread of the tropical mosquito-borne diseases such as malaria, dengue, chikungunya, and Zika, including to Europe and North America. The decline of water and food security with one in four persons suffering water shortages and hunger rising from 795 million to 2 billion people. Deserts will advance 10% and up to 50% of the world's species will be placed in danger. Our fourth conclusion is that if executed as is, the Paris Agreement on Climate Change will increase water and food shortage, mortality and disease and ecosystem decline, sabotaging the Sustainable Development Goals as well as the desertification and the biodiversity conventions. What needs to be done is reduce 21 gigatons to 34 gigatons from 55. That would put us on track for 1.5 degrees. This can only be achieved by the largest emitters. The Paris Agreement is designed to kick the can down the road to 2025 when there'll be the next roll of the voluntary device and to say that humanity's destiny is going to be determined by a roll of a voluntary dice, and that what comes up is that's it. What we need is the largest three emitters with 48% of the emissions, the largest 72, uh, the, the 10 largest with 72% of the emissions, and the 20 largest with 78% of the emissions, and 76% 76 of the world's gross national income. Only they can solve the problem. And this requires the United States, the European Union, and the rest of the West, and the rest of the large emitters. This is not developed and underdeveloped. This is large emitters and small emitters. And the hundred smallest emitters represent 3%. That's not where the solution lies. It can only come from the large emitters. So it, we have to come to terms with Paris getting the large emitters off the hook so that they increase their level of ambition now not in 2025, which will be too late to affect the amount of CO2 in the air in 2025. I would like to finish by mentioning that Nicaragua has only 0.03% of emissions. We don't make a difference one way or the other internationally, but we've gone from 25% renewable energy in 2007 to 56% last year, and will be by 90% in 2020, on the basis of $2.9 billion in foreign direct investment. As part of the Forest Carbon Partnership, Nicaragua is committed to sequestering 11 million tons of CO2e in the next five years. Our emissions last year were 4.8 million tons, and we have already taken 2.1 million off of that by the conversion to renewable energy. If little Nicaragua, the second poorest country in Latin America in the Caribbean, can make these advances, Certainly the West and the, large, the rest of the large emitters, be they developed or underdeveloped, can begin increasing their levels of ambition now and not in 2025 in order to save us from a three-degree world. And only that will make environmental standards meaningful. What is not being addressed is the fact that endless, limitless, mindless accumulation and concentration of wealth on a planet with limited resources cannot be continued if we are to have sustainable development. Thank you.